So welcome to this episode of GoTo Unscripted. We are live at GoTo Aarhus, uh, which is very exciting. It's my first time in Denmark and indeed my first time at GoTo, so that's been lovely. I'm Charles Humble. I am currently Container Solutions Chief Editor, and I'm joined by Holly Cummings from uh, Red Hat, where she is a Senior Principal Software Engineer in the Quarkus team. Have I got that right? More or less, <laughs> yeah. very long job title. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's good. So we met up last night over dinner at the conference dinner briefly. Uh, where the brilliant Sam Aaron was doing his live coding DJing thing, which was phenomenal. Um, and in the middle of that, we were talking on the same table, but to different people, and we both basically had exactly the same cloud native story, which was so funny, which was essentially this thing of, you know, we're going to microservices because we want to move faster, but then we have a change control board who meets like twice a year, and you know, so, yeah, possibly microservices are not the answer to your problem. And I found myself thinking as, as we were chatting off camera that there is this, this thing about sort of shoehorning architectures into cultures where they don't belong. And I thought with some of your background from your consulting days at IBM Garage, that might be just an interesting sort of thread to pull on a little bit. So do you have sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's sort of two two anti-patterns that we see. One One is shoehorning the architecture into the place where it just doesn't fit, it's solving the wrong problem. The other thing I see a lot is maybe the architecture is actually the right architecture, but we haven't looked enough at the surrounding context and tried to figure out, well, what's actually necessary for this to be successful? So with microservices, for example, what happens a lot is, first of all, a lot of organizations don't actually ask, what problem am I trying to solve by going to microservices? They assume that because everybody else is going to microservices, it must be the right thing for them. Yeah. Um, but then once we go one step further than that, um, then it's, okay, I, I want to go to microservices because I'd like to move faster, which is a, a reasonable goal, and that's definitely something that the style is suited to. And then it's, okay, so I've switched to microservices, so I've made my application distributed, and now I'm going to go faster. Well, no, making your application distributed doesn't make it go faster. What you have to then look at is, well, how often do I release? What's the process for a release? Also, how do I test these things? And if I have to test everything in a big homogenous monolith, because otherwise I don't have the confidence, then actually the fact that there's distributed communication doesn't matter because it is deployed as a monolith. So then it's, it's just, yeah, that, that slightly bigger picture of what are the conditions for success? Have I looked outside the code to make sure that those conditions are for success are there? Yes, yeah. I, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things there. So there's the classic getting your sort of service boundaries right so you can mm. deploy things independently, which is actually incredibly hard a lot of the time. Mm. And, you know, I have certainly worked on systems, and I wouldn't be surprised if you have as well, where it's like, we've got a bunch of microservices, but this lot all have to be updated at the same time, because otherwise the whole thing breaks, right? Yeah. And yeah, all you've exactly. done is make everything more complicated. Exactly. But then also, I think those the sort of cultural aspects of, um, it's a bit like, I mean, you know, there was that time when everyone was doing a sort of agile transformation, and I think now we hear agile transformation and kind of shiver a little bit inside. Right? Yeah. It's, and yet they're still going on. And it's still happening. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. But it's that, because it's, you're, you're trying to, you, in order to, for this to be effective, you need to change the way people work. Mm. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you want to move faster than that, that require, I mean, that's, I mean, there are various reasons why people go this route, but that's certainly one of the ways, reasons that people go this route. And that requires you to, you know, work in smaller chunks, have less work in progress, all the stuff that we kind of know. Mm. But in large enterprises, in my experience, actually making that change stick is incredibly difficult. And I think that's kind of, kind of interesting as well. I think a lot of it is about trust and there's two sides to the trust. One is the cultural side of is there a culture of fear or do people have the autonomy or does everything have to go through a central silo of regulation and control? Mm -hmm. And part of that is about in regulated industries and that ends up being more necessary but not entirely necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, but then the other part of it is the technical trust, because often the reason organizations are unwilling to deploy their microservices individually is because there's, 
you know, it, it's not a paranoia. It's, it, there is a quite a high likelihood that if deployed individually, they would break. So it, it makes sense to have a, a QE phase where everything is tested in a, in a, in a batch. And, but the thing is that both of that are resolvable. And so there's things like contract testing can, and fuzz testing and matrix testing and that kind of thing to some extent, can give an organization the confidence to be able to deploy without having to do the testing of everything in a big batch, which gives you such, such a win for the speed and really brings you much closer to those goals that you were probably trying to to do by going to microservices. Yes. I, I've also seen the thing of developers or, or senior developers or architects being kind of attached to particular sort of styles of architecture that maybe don't quite work in the distributed yeah. world. You know, the, the, the classic used to be, you know, you had a load of microservices and then one central database. I think we've probably got away from that more or less. But you do see things like, you know, I really want transactions, but distributed transaction coordination is is quite hard and you get into that, you know, I need sort of compensation, compensating transactions or, you know, sort of saga pattern stuff. And again, I, I just, I wonder if there's a, there's a sort of, um, there's a sort of connection there in the same way that changing the way people work at a cultural level to mm. changing the way software architects kind of think about what I, they're doing. I think so. And I think it's really easy to, to sort of judge as well. And to go, oh, look, you're doing things the way that you used to do them five or ten years ago. Silly you. But there's such a lot of cognitive load. And, and there's now, you know, there's sort of all these interesting charts that show how our cognitive load as developers has increased so much compared to where it used to be. And so then that does mean that realistically it's, it's hard to keep up. And, you know, that's not, it's not because we're stupid. It's just because there's a lot coming at us. And sometimes you have to say, okay new style of transactions that's just a bit too much for, for me to digest at the moment. I will stick with what I know because that's what humans are good at. Right, yes, yes. I think something else I was sort of reflecting on quite a lot. I mean, we started in the industry a similar time. I think I was a little before you, but, but that sort of point where uh, everything was sort of proprietary and you know, everything was closed source and knowledge sharing was a real, was a real problem. And so the second part of my career, I spent a lot of time just thinking about how we as an industry get better at sharing knowledge and passing on what we know. But I was interested to get your reflections on that, because obviously you've kind of come through that same, mm. that same sort of transformation of a sort in our own industry, I guess. I just think it's so incredibly positive and it feels almost utopian, actually, the, the, the sort of shift from proprietary to open source. And it, it just seems to benefit everybody which is really nice. It's, it's nice when you get something where it's not, you know, there's one set of winners and there's one set of losers. All of us are, are benefiting. So you have the sort of the enterprises, like I work for Red Hat now, they've made a very successful business on 100% open source. But then for me as an individual developer as well, it's just so delightful that if I need something, I can go and I can access it and it's open source. And if I find it doesn't work, I can fix it because it's open source. And it's just, it's hard to imagine even now going back to the days where everything was just so closed and you didn't know what was going on under the covers and sometimes there would be quite a simple bug but you couldn't fix it because you just didn't have that access. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge, huge change. And of course we also came up through the sort of very early stages of, of Java. So if I remember right, mm. you were on the WebSphere team at IBM. I was, yeah. And then on WebSphere Liberty, I think it was called, yeah, the sort of, exactly. you know, the kind of, um, the, the, the sort of sequel, as it were, to, to the original WebSphere product. And again, I think it's quite interesting to think about that as well, because Java has obviously been around a very, very long time. It's still a very widely used language, but the world that it was kind of conceived mm. for from an architectural or from a software point of view is radically different from the world we find ourselves in now. So, you know, WebSphere was designed to 
it was slow to start, but then you, it would sit and run pretty much forever if you exactly, left it alone. Exactly, forever. And the, and the scale of forever, I think, is one that sort of doesn't really even make sense to us now, you know, that it would go and, and it would be, it would not be restarted for six months, a year, that kind of thing. And, and so it was designed to be incredibly dynamic because you were basically changing the engine as the plane was running. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when we went to Webster Liberty, we, we made it even more dynamic, in fact, so you could, you know, you really, you could change every single part of it as it was running. Um, there was an interesting thing with, with Webster Liberty, actually, because obviously, originally, Webster wasn't conceived for the cloud because the cloud didn't exist when, when it was being written. Um, and with Webster Liberty, the problem that they started out trying to solve was how do we keep the same programming model as people are used to with um, with WebSphere, so you know that 100% compatibility really, but make it a friendlier experience for developers because developers do not start their application server and leave it running for six months. That's just not how we how we work. And so we made it so that it was much quicker and lighter to start and that kind of thing. And that was just at around the dawn of the cloud. And then we realized that catering for those developer requirements actually made it incredibly well suited for the cloud, which was something that it was just a happy coincidence, but, and I think if you said, did you know that developers are exactly like clouds, it would be a nonsensical statement. <laughs> <laughs> but the requirements end up being similar. And we've sort of seen it a little bit, that sort of that same thing, um, because now I, I work on the, the Quarkus team, and Quarkus was very much designed ground up to be a cloud native um, way of running Java. And so the, the with the dynamism that you have in more traditional runtimes, you pay a tax for that. But when you're running in a container, you don't need that dynamism. So it makes no sense to be paying the tax. So things like reflection are, are expensive at runtime. Um, and so what we've done with Quarkus is we've massively reduced the amount of reflection. We've, we've moved more to be build time optimized and then that means that at runtime you have a quicker startup which may or may not be helpful um, but you have lower memory requirements which almost certainly is helpful because in the cloud memory is money and you have faster throughput which <laughs> is always helpful um, but then as sort of a, a consequence of that then so it goes in the other direction um, because it does more at build time for a developer that's not necessarily ideal because we're building all of the time. So then the question is, okay, so what do we do so that you don't have to do all of that build time op optimization for the whole application every time you change a line of code? And so what they've done is they've built a really, really good live reload experience and a really, really good continuous testing experience so that you have, again, it's that sort of that same combination of a really optimized for the cloud, but also this delightful developer experience. Um, and there's, then there's sort of two, <laughs> two aspects to the developer experience. One is just the, the liveness and the hotness. But then there's another, again, I think slightly unintended consequence, which is if you do more at build time, you understand the context in which the application is running much better which means that a whole bunch of boilerplate that we used to have to write as developers to say, okay, so this is there and this is there and you know, could you please do that, isn't necessary anymore because there's a deeper optimization phase at build time. So then it ends up being better for developers just because they have to write less code as well. So can you talk about a bit more about sort of how that works? Because as you say, you're doing the as I understand it, you're, 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 you're effectively building, you're using the Graal VM, I think, right? So you're doing sort of native images, but I'm presuming you're not doing that when you're doing your normal development work because that would be too slow, right? So yeah, yeah, a native compilation is about, <clears throat> yeah, it seems to take about three minutes. Or, I mean, that sort of obviously depends on the application, but it's sure, a sort but of or, order of magnitude. Yes. But one of the things about Quarkus, which is interesting actually, is it can run in two modes. Um, so it can run as a native application or it mm -hmm. can run on JVM. And native, I think, is getting a lot of the headlines because the startup times are just dazzling. Like it, I benchmarked it and it's actually faster than an LED light bulb to start up, which is, you know, it's just, 
<laughs> flat kind out, of incredible. Yeah. It? yeah. And when I, when I first did my, my native application and I just like started it, <laughs> and then I stopped it and I started it because <laughs> it was just so magical. <laughs> yes. um, but what we do see, and that's, that's all built on Graal VM, yeah. but what we do see with the native applications, I think, I think the, the gap will shrink, but with the native applications, the throughput does tend to be lower. So the startup time is just absurdly fast. The memory is quite small. So if you're running in a constrained environment or if you're doing something like serverless or any kind of scale to zero, or if you want to have kind of a cloud bursting pattern, then it absolutely makes sense. If you're running an application the way you've always run your application, native maybe isn't the best choice, but the optimizations that the Quarkus team did to make it work well on native, it turns out actually are optimizations for Java as well. So if you run on JVM, some of those things like doing more at build time, getting rid of reflection, actually mean it's faster at, at, um, on, the, on the JVM as well. So we see, even on the JVM, the resource consumption is about half of what an application that wasn't using Quarkus would be, which is pretty incredible. Yeah, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's just so good. And again, you know, that's sort of across the board. So like the throughput is higher, not twice as high, I think. Again, it depends what application, but certainly the throughput is significantly higher. Your memory consumption, everything, it, you know, means that you can run in a much more economical environment. Right, yeah. I want to pick that up in a sec, but I'm curious about the um, what the sort of programming model feels like, how you handle things like sort of dependency injection and that sort of stuff. Because again, it is quite a... It's quite a change from, you know, the sort of Java and J2EE, if we're that old, and even sort of early days of the spring. It's quite a, it's quite a shift in terms of the sort of programming model in some ways. Yes and no. Um, what, what they've done is they've, in general, they've, um, they've stuck to the standards. So um, it, it, if you're using MicroProfile, then your microprofile application, that's the sort of the, the, the base programming model for Quarkus. So your microprofile application will work fine. Um, if you're using Hibernate, for example, the Hibernate team virtually sit next to the Quarkus team. So again, you know, there's a really nice integration there. Um, what you can do though, is you can do less of it. So um, things like, yeah, just some of the boilerplate that you might have to do with Java EE or with, with MicroProfile, there's less of it. And we have, um, we have some libraries that again build on top of it just to give you that slightly slicker experience. So for example, we've got a library called Panache, which builds on top of Hibernate. And it, it means that quite a lot of the things that you do with Hibernate, you end up having to do sort of in every application. Let me have a method that gets everything. Let me have, and it just, auto creates those methods. Um, so it's quite nice. One of the other things, and again, in injection is really core to the programming model, and it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the micro profile injection. And we do it for all sorts of things and in, in quite cool and clever ways. So for example, if you're using Hibernate and a database, you can, in your application properties, you can configure where your application, your database lives. But if you don't configure it, because we understand what's in the application, we can look and say, ah, you're using a database, and yet you do not have a database. That will be a problem for you. <laughs> Let me use test containers to magically spin up a database. Because, you, be, because you're using the injection, you don't need to tell me about test containers. You don't need to say, please, could you use test containers to give me a database? We'll just find those injection points, put the test containers database, in there and then it just magically works. So that's useful for testing, but it's also useful again in the dev mode. Be so it means that you can just start going and you haven't actually done anything to define a database and you have a database. You don't want to deploy to production like that, but you know, it gets you a lot of the way. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I was just thinking as well, so one of the things I remember reading in the quite early days of the, the ground VM stuff was, you know, you can't use reflection and there were various other things. You know, there were there were limitations that mm. came along with essentially trying to run a virtual machine language mm. natively, which is partly surprising. Yeah. 
Um, I haven't really followed how much that's kind of shifted and evolved with time. But in terms of, I mean, I'm presuming the sort of the big, li I mean, you mentioned Hibernate, so I'm presuming the big libraries have done work to make themselves more GraalVM compatible. But how's that sort of story evolved? Because to be honest, I haven't really followed it. So, so it's not my expert area, but um, the understanding that I have is um, that a lot you do you do definitely do need work. So you need to do things like declaring what happens by reflection and that kind of thing. And what we've what we've ended up doing for a lot of it is we've put that extra stuff in Quarkus. Mm -hmm. um, so a question came round on one of our internal mailing lists recently to sort of say, I'd like to do a, a natively compiled application and I want to use these libraries. And could I do just with straight GraalVM? And the answer was yes, but it will be an awful lot of work and you'll have to chase a lot of bugs. And if you do it with Quarkus, it will just work. So we've sort of, yeah, tried to, to take those, those extra things that you need to do because um, some of them aren't trivial. Some of them, again, need to be extra things that are done, extra declarations, but some of them are extra s steps that happen in the build phase. So that's hard to do without something a bit external and something that has those injection points in the build phase to say, okay, now let me look around and make sure that everything's going to work. And, and we have seen that, yeah, some, you know, sometimes when frameworks take those libraries and try and put them in GraalVM, it doesn't always work. Right, yes, yeah. Does, are there specific kind of sweet spots for Quarkus? So there are specific places right now where you think that's, you know, the, absolutely the right kind of use case. Where would you recommend people pick it up and, and, and choose it over, over one of its competitors or one of the alternatives? I mean, to be honest, <laughs> Almost, almost everywhere. Um, so, a lot of the conversation about Quarkus has, because of the native mode, has focused on those serverless applications, that kind of thing, um, and microservices. Um, but we are seeing it being used as well for the larger monoliths. Um, at, at some point, if you have a very large monolith, you may end up with some class path contention and conflicting dependencies and that kind of thing if your dependency space becomes too big, mm -hmm. and that so far is not the sweet spot for Quarkus um, because it does have a flat class path. But right. assuming you're not at that scale of dependency hell, for almost everything else, Quarkus works really well because it's the Java EE programming model, it's the microprofile programming model, um, but the resource consumption is, is so much smaller. Um, so everywhere we it will be a benefit. The benefit will probably be multiplied for things like microservices. Um, so going back to that discussion that we were having at the beginning about, are we applying these patterns unthinkingly and are they perhaps creating problems? One of the things that we're starting to see now is businesses are coming to us and they're saying, I've switched to microservices and I have uh, my bi business agility is great, but unfortunately my cloud bill has quadrupled, which I wasn't really hoping for. Because when you when you imagine that for each application there's the the cost of the application and then there's the cost of the framework and then there's the cost of the infrastructure, so your your control plane and you know your nodes and that kind of thing. And if you have so many more nodes, then that means that your your infrastructure tax is going up. And sometimes you know your memory consumption and that kind of thing is really much higher. And so th those organizations, when they switch to Quarkus, are able to then get their cloud bills back to a much more acceptable level. Right, yes. And I know you've also done some work, I mean, you sort of touched on this already, but you've also done some work looking at effectively the sort of carbon footprint mm. of running Quarkus versus other leading frameworks we could name, but probably shouldn't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so can you talk a bit about that? How's that kind of, I know that's an area of interest for you, but how's mm. that kind of worked out? What are you seeing? What are you measuring? Because obviously measuring carbon is in itself quite a... Quite a challenge. Quite a challenge still. I mean, it's something as an industry we need to get better at and we're starting to look at, but it's, it's an interesting 
a very difficult area in many ways. Yeah, there's sort of a side conversation there of, as you say, measuring carbon is hard. It really shouldn't be because it's really important. Can we make this easier? So some of my colleagues are looking at that. But when I when I joined the Quarkus team, we kind of we knew it was really light. We knew it was really fast. We didn't actually. We thought intuitively that should translate to being greener, but we didn't have any evidence for that. We hadn't done the measurements, and so I did sort of a, a series of measurements. One was um, doing it by inference. So if you know what cloud instances you're running on, you can work backwards to an approximate carbon footprint. Um, and that was sort of for real life load over an extended period of time. And the other one was in a more controlled environment where we had instrumentation in the CPU and we could see exactly how much energy was being used and then translate that to carbon. Um, and in both cases, what was really good is when you do a measurement in two different ways, you really hope that the results are kind of consistent. That gives you a sense of confidence. And the results were pretty consistent. In both cases, we saw that the carbon footprint with Quarkus was reduced by a factor of about two or three. So that was really nice. Um, but one of the things that was interesting and, and surprising to us was when I, I first got the results back where we compared um, native and JVM applications. So again, we looked at Quarkus on JVM, Quarkus native, um, a more you know, alternative framework on native and alternative framework on JVM. And because native has such tiny resource usages, you would assume that it has the lowest carbon footprint. And I think certainly there's ways that you can run it in which that is definitely the case. You have it in a highly elastic mode, you, you know, you scale to zero when it's not being used, definitely it enables that. But if you just take it as I have steady load and I'm running it, the footprint of native, the carbon footprint is higher than the carbon footprint of running Quarkus on JVM and the same for, for other frameworks. Um, and it's because there's a couple of things that contribute to the footprint. One is the memory, mm -hmm. where it's much better on native, but the other one is the throughput. So you need to handle the same no load, you need more native instances. And so then that means that overall, your, through, your um, carbon footprint ends up being a bit higher. So it's sort of, it, yeah, it's interesting. And it's also, I think, slightly annoying because it was such a counterintuitive result. And that means that when, you, when you're reducing carbon, you know, ideally you want it to be that you can just do what seems to be the intuitively right thing and get the right outcome. And here we kind of saw, oh, actually, no, you do need to be a bit more data-driven and evidence-based and actually do the graft to measure it because otherwise, I mean, it's not a disaster. Either, if you're running on Quarkus, either way, you're better off. But if you wanted to maximize the, the greenness, you would run Quarkus on JVM. Yeah, which, as you say, is it's not what I would have thought either, right? It's sort of no, because there's so much of this. You know, if if you want to be greener, you like rewrite and rewrite everything in Rust or something. You yeah. know, and there have been some studies done on the relative carbon footprint mm. of different programming languages, which you've probably seen. I'm not yeah. honestly sure how much weight I would put behind some of those, but you know, yeah, I mean, micro they're micro benchmarks, so right? They, yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, the one, one interesting thing with that study that I will, I will call out, because again, it's a bit counterintuitive, because um, normally we sort of have this mental hierarchy where we imagine that the, the compiled languages are better and the harder languages are better, um, which you know, we see, sort of see in, in the, that result. So C and C++ and Rust were all extremely efficient. There wasn't much to choose between them. And then we imagine, oh, a language like Go, which is kind of hard and quite compiled, that's going to be better. But actually, Go was, had a higher carbon footprint than Java. And that was even before looking at something like Quarkus, which has the carbon footprint of Java. So it does mean that definitely if you are using Java, and overall, I think they looked at like maybe 60 languages, and Java was fifth. So Java, even before Quarkus, is really, because it's so fast, because it's, it's just been so optimized, and the GC is really optimized, the JIT is really optimized. It means that if you're using Java and you want to keep using Java because you like that programming model, you're in an okay place. You can you can keep doing that. Yeah, I, I found that genuinely surprising mm. that how high, you know, how high it was. I was also kind of amused by how terrible Python turned out to be. Yeah, which was also kind <laughs> of a bit of. A, I mean, you kind of figure it's not going to be great, but it was sort of startling how yeah how bad it actually was. And given that you know, like obviously we're at a tech conference and everyone is talking about machine learning, kind of in the the, the coffee 
spaces and whatever because of chat GPT and all of those sorts of things. Yeah. It's just kind of interesting to reflect on how much particularly data science type work is done with things like Python and R, I suppose, mm. and those kind of things. And a lot of those languages are quite bad from a carbon point of view, which is kind of interesting, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think for the data science workloads, it's not quite as bleak as it seems from those micro benchmarks, because I think a lot of the, the heavy lifting is, is um, outsourced away from the actual Python runtime. Yes, yeah. But still, it's not all of it is, and, and so it, you know, it is worth thinking yeah, about. Yeah, I think the other thing there, of course, is like training a large model is incredibly expensive, incredibly but that means expensive. that people don't do it that often. You know, there's yeah. only really three or four companies that have the kind of the resources and the money to do that, and then everyone else is building on what they're doing. So yeah. it may not be quite, as you say, it's not quite as bleak as, as, as we mm. might think it is. Thinking about sort of sustainable software more generally, are there other things that you think as developers we ought to be thinking about when we're thinking about our kind of environmental impact on the world and sort of thinking about I don't know, demand shaping or, or those sort of areas. Yeah, there's some, some, there's some really interesting and cool and kind of challenging and not yet built technologies in this area, which is always exciting because everybody loves a problem. And there's some really easy no-brainers in this area, which is also good. So um, the sort of the first thing to think about is where your workload is running in general um, and if it's in not all, not all regions of the world have the same electricity mix and some is very dominated by coal in others it, for example the nordics it's it's much more focused on renewable energy mm -hmm. so in a lot of cases you can move your workload and slash the carbon footprint for no work at all and often as well actually the hosting costs can be cheaper in an area with clean energy than one with dirty energy. So again, it's kind of, why wouldn't you do that? Um, sometimes there's latency reasons why not to do it, but if, if you, there's um, a site called Electricity Maps, and you, you can look and you can see. Um, and most areas of the world, except for maybe Asia Pacific, where, where the energy mix overall is a bit more challenging, um, there's something that has acceptable data re residency and acceptable latency that will be on greener energy. So that's just the kind of the no-brainer. But then as you say, the demand shaping is the next thing of a lot of renewable energy tends to be intermittent. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of us think, okay, I'll run this overnight and that will be greener. But not if your energy is solar. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Um, yes. And so, so then there's, we're start starting to see now this kind of carbon-based dispatching where you can get the real-time information that says, well, the sun isn't shining in Denmark because it's Denmark. However, the wind is blowing in Scotland because it's Scotland. So why don't you run it on the wind energy in Scotland? Whereas tomorrow, actually, the sun will be shining in Sweden. So then you can, you know, move your workload there. And as long as you've written your workload in a modern way where it has the atom potency and where it can be scaled down and up and moved around, then again, for you get your disaster recovery kind of for free because you've proved that you can take your workload and pop it up in various places and it works, which is good. The business will thank you. And you're also lowering your carbon footprint. So yeah, and, and, and the other thing that's sort of related to that, I think, is thinking about do you need your all of your workloads to be sort of real time and that kind of thing? You know, going oh, back to yeah. we used to do a lot of stuff in batch when mm. I started in the industry, and we kind of went away from that because computers got quick and fast and mm. cheap. Um, <clears throat> but maybe you know you can batch something and, and, as you say, run it somewhere else when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing or mm. whatever renewable source you've got. But you don't need that kind of real time thing, mm. which is maybe something to factor in. Yeah, definitely. Um, the other thing that I was sort of interested about, so you spent a lot of your career, one way or another, working with Java. So what mm. is it about Java itself that you like? Why are you sort of drawn to it as a language and, a, and an infrastructure? It, it, I mean, languages mm. is such an interesting question because now, because I've worked with Java for so long, I, I speak Java. And I, I was quite surprised a while ago when I was working with people who were coming from JavaScript and they were trying, I was watching them trying to program Java, I was pair programming with them, and they were stumbling and I was thinking, 
what, why is this not obvious to you? Um, and so similarly, you know, when I go to, to some other languages, sometimes I find it really hard and the people who are m more accustomed to that language say it's easy. Um, so part of, I, you know, if I'm, if I'm honest, part of the appeal of Java for me is that kind of incumbency and um, inertia. But on the other hand, when you look at the Java ecosystem as a whole, there's so much to, to love about the language. It, I think it has a really nice combination of stability. Um, so I was watching someone a while ago, they did a demo and they took code that was from 2008 and they ran it. And it, and it, it not only was it, it wasn't Hello World, it was actually using their product and using the library and it still worked. And there's not many ecosystems where you could take co code that ancient that was actually written before some Java programmers were born, <laughs> realistically, right, and, it, yes. and it just worked. And yet at the same time, the Java ecosystem is absolutely not stagnant. So you have the emphasis on backwards compatibility, but also the emphasis on, on forward progression. So if you look at GraalVM, for example, that's just such a huge change and it's so exciting. And then if you look at something, and that's you know, sort of in, in, the, in, the, in the JVM, or in, you know, in, it now is, but then if you look at something like Quarkus and the sort of, you know, the ecosystem that's built up around Java as well, you get all of these incredibly exciting, cool things. And I think that's exactly what you want, isn't it, of type safety to save you from yourself and stability to save you from the past or the future, depending which way you're trying to run it, and yet forward progression so that you still get the new shinies and it still just keeps improving and you still get that little endorphin rush as well. If you go to a new Java version, you're like, oh, this is cool. Yeah, yeah. I think I would add as well, Java has a particular quality about the way people write Java code. Like everyone's Java code looks very similar, mm. which means you can pick someone else's code up and follow it and make sense of it in a mm. way that is not, I think, true of all languages. I'm not quite mm. sure what it is about Mm. I mean, some of that, I think, some of that is probably when people talk about sort of the base, verbosity in the language and whatever, mm. it's sort of slightly related to that, I think, that there isn't a lot of sort of, you know, sort of magical, the sort of uh, meta template programming type stuff from C++ or Beast or any of those things where you're like, I've got yeah. no idea what this does anymore. Java's like a very easy language to follow. Yeah. And there's not the technical capability and there's not the culture of saying, I could write this in 10 lines so it's understandable, or I could write it in six characters to show that I'm a rock star. <laughs> yes. You know, you just don't get that in, in Java. Yeah, yeah, I think that's interesting too. So in terms of what you're working on at the moment and what you're doing at the moment, what's kind of exciting to you that you're doing? What's sort of motivating you at the moment? So a lot of what I'm looking at now um, is, is that sustainability um, and and looking at Quarkus and sustainability and looking at sustainability in more general. Um, and another thing that I'm looking at again is, is going back to the microservices and the how can we deploy microservices with confidence because if we can't deploy microservices with confidence, what is the even point of microservices? And I think contract testing is a huge part of that and contract testing isn't very widely used. And so I'm trying to figure out, well, why isn't it widely used? What are the barriers to it? which is partly just talking about it, but it's, I think it's also more fundamental of why aren't we all contract testing? What do we have to change? Good. Well, thank you so much. It's been lovely to chat to you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.